Ready? All right. Hello, everybody, and uh, welcome for coming. Thank you for having me. Um, I'm Mike Vitez. I am a, a longtime journalist. Um, basically, it's all I've ever done is uh, tell stories. I'm a storyteller. I was a high school journalist, a college journalist. Uh, I've worked at newspapers. In fact, I in fact just left the Philadelphia Inquirer after 30 years a few weeks ago to, to reinvent myself and tell stories in new places and new ways. Um, there's a few things that you should know about me. One is that I'm an old runner myself. I once ran a 437 mile in wow. high school. You know, that's pretty funny. Although I had three kids, all of whom are runners or were runners. One, my youngest actually ran here at Princeton, graduated in 214. They were way better than I ever was. I still try to do triathlons and distance runs and poorly, but I enjoy them and I still do them. Um, second thing I want to say is that I have learned that we live in a world of noise and news and information and we're assaulted by it and it numbs us and that most people tune out. And what I've learned as a journalist and a storyteller is that the way to penetrate that din, the way to to unite people and stir people and bring people together is by telling stories. And um, the also I, I've learned about myself is that I have become, I'm sort of a mission-driven storyteller. I try to write stories that inspire, that really lift the heart. Uh, I carry around in my wallet actually a quote from William Faulkner who talks about that when he won the Nobel Prize and, and uh, talks about the mission of a writer, the purpose of a writer to really remind reader, to remind his audience of the sort of great human qualities of our uh, dedication and devotion and faith and, and honor and passion and in my own small way as a daily journalist all these years, I really tried to write stories that do that. And <clears throat> so the, uh, so I have really, like, um, like all of you, like endurance sports, to be a good storyteller, you know, requires that you go all out, go all in, and don't take shortcuts. And, you know, this is just one example of a story about a guy um, who, his son went to LaSalle University, and the son was really a very uninspired high school kid who didn't have any direction in life, first kid in the family to go to college. This man worked in a Verizon truck, you know, in, installing cable in people's homes. And he, his, he was amazed that his son came to life and really was turned on by, by his experience at LaSalle. And what the kid loved most, what his son loved most, was going down to Appalachia on spring break and building houses. And he, you know, started out his freshman year on the class, on the LaSalle trip, and then he became more and more involved. And then his fourth year, his third year he ran the trip, and his senior year he was supposed to run it again. And the highlight of the trip, they all take a break and they hike this mountain, and they go stand in front of this, underneath this frozen waterfall. And what happened was a terrible tragedy. The son died in a car accident before this fourth year senior trip. And the father, um, in sort of the grieving process and coping with this total unbelievable heartbreak was he decided he wanted to go, go on this trip in his son's place. He wanted to go there with all these other students. He wanted to build houses. And, he, and I decided, you know, I heard about this, the only way to tell the story was to go. And he was so looking forward to hiking up. And he was a big beer-bellied guy in his late 50s. And he was so excited about hiking up this mountain and getting under the waterfall and it was a pretty treacherous thing to do it's icy it's march and so it was an amazing moment i've always worked with really fabulous photographers and you know it was just a great day to tell his story about what it was like for him um and i just wanted to share that also you talk about endurance sports one of the you know i've had such an opportunity in my life to tell so many different stories in so many places how about longevity? This is actually a story I wrote about a six-generation family. This lady at one time, Sarah Knauss, was 119. She lived 119. I first met her at 115. And 
She was the oldest living woman in the world at the time she died. But this is her daughter, Kitty, who was 95. Who lived in a, she lived in a retirement community. She lived, uh, moved into an apartment building across the street, street still drove at 95. Um, this guy, Bob, is her son and her grandson, and he was 72. So he had three generations on Social Security, and he was still working um, as an accountant. The woman his arm around is his daughter, who is 49, who's a school teacher. And um, this was her daughter, and this is her grandson, who's Bradley, who's three. This girl was 27 at the time. I don't know who the bird is. But anyway, it was um, six generations, and it was really an amazing story to tell about longevity and all the demographics that went on. And... Um, I was really one of the difficult things was how am I going to start this story? And I finally decided I wanted to start with this woman here who's both a great granddaughter and a granddaughter at the same time. And she was working as a school teacher. She was uh, single, divorced, and uh, worked a second job on weekends as a, as a waitress. And so she worked six days a week and she'd get one day off. And she said, The biggest dilemma I have is deciding who am I going to go visit? And so she was. Great, and I really loved, I, I wrote a lot about aging. I uh, won the Pulitzer Prize, writing aging stories. This was about, um, and the photographers who did the uh, series with me won um, for their photography as well. It was a series about changes in end-of-life care in America. You could go to the Pulitzer website and read it. It was really amazing. Uh, this is a story about hospice, and this was a, a man who died, and I sort of followed the hospice workers from the day they arrived at the house through the end of this man's life and it was an amazing story about what hospice did and this was in the late 90s when hospice was still pretty new in America and the story thing about this photo that's so amazing is that you think the son is comforting the father who's dying but if you look closely really the father is comforting the son and it was an amazing picture and you know Ron Cortez who took this shot is was 300 pounds but he was invisible. He was an incredibly, is an incredibly gifted photographer. Could take these most intimate and tender shots, and you'd never know he was there. And he's a giant guy. So the first book I did, I just want to talk about briefly because I loved it and it's so fun. Was I spent a year at the Art Museum steps in Philadelphia. I couldn't. Um, I was always amazed at how people. Uh, I'd often run around the, there's a great loop around the art museum, a nine mile loop, and I'd bike it or I'd run it. Many of you from Philly may know it. It's a, and I'm always amazed, we'd finish and start at the steps, how there are always people there always running and always celebrating at the top, and they're always so happy. And I said to my wife, who's also a journalist, I, uh, there are great stories here, I have to do a book. And one day, and I, I teamed up with a photographer and we spent a year there. We started on New Year's Day, and we discovered that the actor and the movie um, may bring people there, but they come from all over the world to celebrate their own dreams, their own lives, their own um, successes, or they come for motivation. And it was so fun. They run it. We, we, went, we went in the middle of the night. We went in snowstorms. We went in all weather, all times, because our theory is people run at all hours of the day. And they did. And this movie now, next year, is 40 years old, Rocky. Yet every day, in, by the gazillions, they run. And I can't tell you how many people, when we started to do this book, thought, what a silly idea. Who wants to do a book? You know, who's going to ever want to do this book? It's like you take it for granted in Philadelphia. But when you really spent time there and listened to them and met the people, their stories were incredible. This, just to fly through some of these, this was an actress who uh, took the red-eyed, uh, she's an actress from, Phila from L.A., this was her boyfriend who she left in the dust running up the steps, and she was there at 7.30 in the morning on New Year's Day, she'd taken the red-eye in to meet his parents, but she was hoping for a breakout year and wanted to come for motivation. Well, these guys are a great story, they, uh, I won't even go into it, this guy we used to panhandle on the steps and uh, got into a halfway house and got clean, and now shovels the snow on the steps when it, when it snows, and he had an amazing story. This guy came from France. Rocky changed his life, and I called him the Pilgrim. He uh, was on a fast track to nowhere, saw Rocky on TV, and couldn't believe, identified with Rocky. And, and when he turned his life around, went to college in France, the first thing he did was he came to Philadelphia to run the Rocky Steps. Mm -hmm. We were just there hanging out. All these stories were are real, and they're amazing. This was a woman... Um, 
who had a terrible accident and had a bad brain injury. Her mind is as sharp as anyone in this room, but her brain is injured and she was really limited. But she's an amazing figure, and the, these people, they wanted to bring her to the Rocky Steps because one day, just because they thought her story was so inspiring and they needed to bring her there, and we just happened to be there. Uh, these guys were so excited, they lapsed into Mandarin constantly. Um, <laughs> this guy uh, believed, there were a lot, this guy's not overwhelmed at the top because he's tired. He's overwhelmed at the top because he believes, like a whole demographic of a certain age, he believes that uh, Rocky IV ended the Cold War. And he was just so overwhelmed <laughs> about being there that, and running the steps that he was overcome. He had the gray sweatsuit and the music, but he didn't even wait to cue it up or put on the suit, he just bolted out of his car. And this was a girlfriend at the time who had come to Philly with him. They were allegedly coming for a wedding, but she told me I'm learning an awful lot about him. And the wedding didn't last very long. Uh, this was a guy, if you all know the Rocky stories, this is a guy who believes that, but in Rocky II, you know, he runs up the steps in the epic scene in Rocky I, and then in Rocky II, which is a very bad movie, he has, Stallone has, how do I top what I did in Rocky I? He has thousands of school children follow him up in Rocky II, and they celebrate with him at the top. So this guy is trying to recreate the scene from Rocky II, and he's now lecturing his daughter and all her friends that nobody passes Rocky running up the steps. <laughs> Girls, you can't pass me. And so this is great. Um, proposal was really amazing. This guy's named Moose. You can figure out why. He had an incredible story to tell also why he was there. This guy would run at five in the morning uh, for motivation, and it was cold out, and uh, just, he has a fabulous story. Flavor Flav ran, and that's also a great story about why. Like you just happened to be there when Flavor Flav ran? I just happened to be there. I went there uh, virtually every day for uh, 300, and, well, I was there probably 250 days out of 365. Uh, it, you know, the Rocky Steps aren't far from the Inquirer building. I would ride my bike. Tom Graylish, the photographer who did this with me, would hang out also. And you could never go for more than a couple hours because you'd, you'd get too many stories. And, you know, you, you uh, so we would go at all different times of day, all different kinds of weather. You just never knew who you were going to find. And this was Flavor Flay was in town for uh, uh, a show and wanted to run the Rocky Steps. And he wanted to run the Rocky Steps because he was on The Surreal Life and got with Bridget Nielsen, who played the evil Russian's wife in, in Rocky IV and married Stallone. I mean, and was married to Mrs. To, to Sylvester Stallone at one point, and was now dating him. And he thought, for the symmetry of the situation, he needed to come because he was now there. Yes, in the back. So, 24 hours a day, seven days a week, somebody's running up the. Street. Well, I can't say that, but I will say that uh, you can go at any hour that we went at midnight at 6 a.m. and people would run. You know, people would hang out. You know, drunks after bars closed came by and wanted to run. You just never knew. And people, you know, all the time. But you know, like today, it'd be, it's like waves on the beach. It's always changing. But like today on a gorgeous autumn, uh, autumn day like this, it'd be mobbed. Is totally. that a bigger attraction than the Liberty Bell? It is. Uh, it depends who you ask. It is the Rocky statue and the Rocky steps probably are second to the Liberty Bell, I would say. The most common question they get asked at the Independence Visitor Center is, where are the Rocky steps and how do I get there? And it's where the Philly Marathon. It's where the Philly Marathon starts and ends, right? Absolutely. These guys uh, bonded in high school over uh, Rocky movies, and they, one of them got married in Philly, and they ran the steps. This was a dog named Rocky, saved from a final count and rescued from a shelter, and they were so thrilled with what he had done for their life, they brought him to the steps. These were best friends from Oklahoma, a breast cancer survivor who felt like Rocky, uh, three lifeguards from Bulgaria. A lot of the lifeguards in Philadelphia pools are Bulgarian, and every year, once a year, they show the Rocky movie on the Art Museum steps, part of the Welcome America Festival right around the 4th of July for free, and big crowds come and watch Rocky, and so these guys were the last people there around midnight. They were still there. I couldn't believe it. I'm still in touch with them. They're back in Bulgaria. Um, punk rockers like Rocky, and uh, it's just a great story and a great book and, and great fun. And um, I just wanted to share a little bit about that with you before I tell you about the second book that was so fun, which is really why I'm here, The Road Back. This really started at a poker game. I have to tell you that. The, um, let's check in the time. 
So all the best stories I write start from the ground up. You know, where does a good storyteller get his ideas? He comes from being rooted in the world and being curious about the world. And so I'm in a poker game with newspaper people. And over the years, most of them have left the newspaper as the newspaper industry has suffered. And a good friend of mine who's still in the poker game went to work at Vanguard and, you know, the big mutual fund company. And he was telling me at poker one night about his boss and his boss's son who went to the University of Virginia where I went. And he was thinking that because I was a fellow UVA guy from way a long time ago that I would be interested in their story. And he starts telling me about this accident his boss's son has had and the incredible accident and the incredible recovery he's beginning to make. And I said to him, Craig, you know, that's not only an amazing story, it's an amazing story for the newspaper. And so I wrote a three-part series about this young man for the Inquirer. And really next to the Pulitzer series, I got more reaction to these stories than anything else I ever wrote. The readers were inundating me, where's part four, where's part five? They didn't want it to stop. You know, you talk about people don't read newspapers. Well, it's really about people love a good story. And this was such an incredible story about his, his comeback that I continued to follow him. You know, I'm not the brightest guy in the world, but I'm smart enough to go, There's, this is a great story. So I'm going to tell you a little bit about his story. I, I followed him, and when he did the Iron Man, I took off and then wrote the book. So very briefly, this is the story of Matt Miller. Talk about endurance sports. Um, this, is, this is Emily. Okay, so Matt, who's the main protagonist in my book, falls in love in middle school with a girl named Emily at the Radnor Middle School. And Emily was the oldest of four. And Matt asked her out in eighth grade to go to a movie with him. Matt took the viola and joined the Radnor Middle School Orchestra just so he knew he could be near Emily, who also played the viola. And um, the only good thing ever to come from playing the viola, he said. And he asked her out on a date to go to see a Star Wars movie and eat pizza. And Emily's mother was the kind of woman who liked to chronicle things. And so when Emily was going out on, she's the oldest of four, was going out on her first date in eighth grade with Matt, her mother made her hold a sign that says, first date with her father. And there she is standing there, somewhat totally mortified in her, you know, eighth grade, sort of not quite a butterfly, still a caterpillar stage. But, and so it was so traumatic for her that she went out on one date with Matt but told him forget it. But he never uh, lost the flame or the torch of interest. And by his senior year of high school, they were dating again. And there they are at graduation, uh, with uh, Radnor High School graduations at Villanova. And there he is with Emily. And he was never, he was smitten with her since eighth grade. Um, and they were, they were very close then. Um, what happens is that he goes off to UVA. She goes off to East Carolina. They're apart. Matt swims for, in college for the UVA swim team his first year of, of college. But he really didn't. He swam in high school. And his older brother had, had, was a swimmer at Virginia, had been captain of the team. And Matt sort of felt like he had to follow in his brother's footsteps. But he kind of didn't like swimming. And anyone of you who is an athlete or has done a college sport knows that you've got to be all in in order to do a college sport. And he really was a lot of work. He gave it his all, but after one year he decided he didn't want to do it anymore, and he quit. And he discovered triathlons. And he became this member of the UVA Triathlon Club, and he really got into triathlons. He'd never been on a bike before. Um, he'd never really run before, but he really got into it in a big way. And so by his junior year, he's a serious triathlon, serious triathlete. Emily, um, after two years away, transfers back to Virginia. And so by the beginning of his third year, junior year at UVA, he's the happiest guy in the world. He's decided he wants to be a doctor. He's going to go pre-med. He's a 4 student. He's incredibly fit. His, his resting heartbeat was 42. Um, and Emily is back at UVA, so they're real, or there together. They're really happy. So this is Halloween, two days before his accident. Um, they're he's supposed to be some crazy Frenchman and he is, she is Mrs. Claus and they're at a party. And this was, I guess, the ha you know, maybe the happiest moment of his life prior to that. Um, and then two days later, on a Sunday morning, in early no for like November 1st, um, or November 2nd, two days after Halloween, he and two other guys, if any of you know Charlottesville, Virginia, they get up early in the morning, they go out, they ride 
about 35, 40 miles west to the Blue Ridge. They do a climb, a Category 1 climb, up to the Blue Ridge Parkway. They shed some clothing, high-five each other. They're about 50, 50 miles into their ride. Um, then they're going to ride along the Blue Ridge Parkway for about 15 miles, which is a beautiful ribbon of a road that runs from the Shenandoah National Park all the way to the Smoky Mountain National Park. And it's just two lanes, and it's windy and gorgeous. And then it sort of rolls up and down, and then they were going to sort of turn east and glide back the last 20, 30, 30 miles back to Charlottesville downhill. And so what's happening is, on this morning, is the, it happens to be the, the, nobody drives the Blue Ridge Parkway unless they are interested, unless they're out for a tour. It's a touring road. It's not a road anyone takes to get anywhere fast. And the um, Charlottesville uh, Classic Car Club, the Shenandoah Valley Classic Car Club, is out for a foliage tour. It's 30 cars, and they're going from the Shenandoah National Park down to a lodge in, you know, a, blue, a lodge along the parkway. And it's 30 cars, and these, they're going south, and these three boys are all 20 years old, are going north, and these are Triumphs and Porsches and the, most, the coolest old classic cars. And no, Matt is in, they're riding single files, three riders, he's in the middle. Nobody really under, knows exactly what happened. I've interviewed the riders, I've interviewed the driver, I've interviewed everybody. Matt, as often happens with trauma, has no recollection of anything since taking off his shirt uh, and celebrating at the top about two miles before um, this happened. And uh, best I can determine, he uh, was distracted by looking at the cars and he rolls off the crown of the road on the shoulder, on the right, and loses control and overcompensates and swerves back right across the double yellow line into the path. So he's riding this way and he swerves across and this blue Porsche was the 29th car in the 30-car caravan. And Matt swerves into it. The car is going about 45 miles an hour. He hits it head first. He flies. He's falling as he hits it. He flies into the air, lands on the pavement, still clipped into his pedals. He has um, broken every bone in his face. Um, he has injured his brain. He has stopped breathing. And he's laying there on the pavement. The driver of the 30th car, the last car, the sweeper car, um, looks to his wife, he's about as far away as I am from this gentleman, looks to his wife next to him in the passenger seat and says, that boy is dead. He uh, also gets out of the car, he's the first one there, and this is the first of what the family believes are many, many miracles. He happens to be an anesthesiologist at Martha Jefferson Hospital in Charlottesville like the one person in the world who knows how to open an airway and start you breathing again. And he cradles his boy in his lap. He really he has to make like a battlefield decision. The guy could have, you know, spinal injuries, no, no telling what's really wrong with him, but he's not breathing and he's got to get him breathing again. And he knows that how you do that is you inflict pain. You want to trigger his fight or flight mechanism. So he takes his crumpled, he clears all the broken teeth out of his way, takes his jaw, and yanks it. And... Sure enough, it inflicts such pain that Matt starts breathing again. And Matt's legs are fine. And Matt uh, actually gets up and tries to run off into the woods. And this 60-year-old doctor, anesthesiologist, is just out for a foliage ride uh, with his wife, brings his boy back to life and then tackles him and holds him down. And the other two riders have joined him. And... Uh, I'm going to show you a photo now that is from the, well, before I show you the photo. So what happens is, this is the, about the only place, it's really a windy road. Mostly there are cliffs and drops, and it's really no place to land a helicopter. But in the 350 <coughs> miles, this is a Sunday morning in the south. Of the 350 miles of the Blue Ridge Parkway, it's all covered by volunteer ambulances, except like a three-mile stretch which is near the Wintergreen Ski Mountain, which is, has a year-round professional ambulance crew because people live there year-round, the condos, and they have a... So there's a professional ambulance crew on duty. And so the, there was so, the reception was so bad, one of the bikers, nobody could get a, a bar on their cell phone to call 911. One of the other triathletes runs up this hill, and there's a bunch of boulders on the top of the hill, and he gets one bar, and he 
he calls, you know, 911, and he gets, he calls so many times the, the uh, 911 dispatcher said, we got your call, stop calling, we got it, they're on the way. So an ambulance crew is able to get there quickly because they're on duty, and they're there in the south on a Sunday morning. People, God knows, they might have been in church. It would have taken a long time. Then about a mile down the road is Reed's Gap, one of the only about three places on the whole Blue Ridge Parkway wide enough for a helicopter to land. And so the helicopter lands, the ambulance gets there, and within an hour of this accident, he is in the University of Virginia Hospital in trauma, you know, getting surgery. And so if every, it was like the perfect storm in reverse. Everything had to work absolutely perfectly for him to have a chance. The next picture is very graphic, but I share it with you quickly just to show you the extent of his injuries. That is a 3D CAT scan of his face. This is a breathing tube, but you see how everything is just shattered and destroyed. Um, the doctor was sure that he would not survive the ambulance ride, much less the helicopter ride. You know, when the ambulance, the doctor got him breathing again. The ambulance drivers were sure that he'd never survived the helicopter ride. The helicopter pilot and crew couldn't, you know, thought he'll never survive the operating table. And, you know, the story is really not so much what happened on the mountain, but the heart of my book and the story is what happened after. So Matt is in an induced coma because he's, you know, they have to rebuild his face. They're, they, they, with 48, um, there's eight or nine different uh, titanium rods in his face, and they have about... Um, 50 screws, titanium screws. It's this incredible reconstruction. And the, the one facial trauma surgeon was just about to go um, to the Middle East on a speaking tour. He was leaving that morning, the next morning. And he was, luckily he was still there when Matt came in and they called him in and he did the reconstruction. Um, they weren't sure if, his, if, his, if he was going to survive, if he would live because his brain was so injured and they weren't sure if he would survive, would he, what kind of function would he have, would he be himself, and then there was the issue of his face was so damaged, would it ever, what would it look like, would the nerves ever come back, um, and, and he's in this induced coma for a while, when he comes out of the coma, his first words to his brother are, can I go to physics lab, and within like a week, he's, he's asked his parents to go get his textbook, and he's highlighting physics, in his, uh, with a marker in the, in the ICU bed. And when he finally gets out, and, and Matt's goal, this happened November 1st, was to get out of the hospital by Thanksgiving. People didn't think that he would get out of the hospital by a year from Thanksgiving. But he was determined, and it was the most amazing sort of three weeks, all kinds of little battles and victories over whether to get a feeding tube and could he get enough nutrition and should they do this surgery or that surgery? You know, his carotid artery by one of these bones in his face, you know, dug into his carotid artery and they were fearful he was going to stroke at any moment. And they had to do, they do the surgery on that and try to repair the artery. Uh, just so many difficult choices and questions and things that went on. And, but it's an amazing thing. He gets out of the hospital on Wednesday before Thanksgiving. He gets to go, and the parents have a place nearby. They're from, all from the Philadelphia area, but they have a little place in Charlottesville nearby because they were UVA alum. And so he's still got his jaw wired shut. He's still got a trach in him, okay? I mean, he can breathe, but he's still got the trach tube because they think they got to do more surgeries. So he still has a hole in his throat. He can't, he's sucking everything down through a straw. He can't actually open his mouth or speak. And he writes a note to his father, he says, you know, he didn't know any of this. None, and he didn't remember any of this, but they had told him. His friends had told him and the people had told him that there was a man on the mountain who had saved his life. And Matt said, writes to his dad, let's go visit. Let's go thank the man on the mountain who saved my life. And so this is Dr. Harris, who is the anesthesiologist. And he had, he had no idea that Matt would survive. He had a friend at the UVA hospital that told him that Matt had survived, but he, he never expected to see the boy again. He never expected the boy would live. And if any of you are physicians or no physicians, or you can imagine that lots, you know, surgeons, family doctors, lots of people have relationships with their patients, but a lot of anesthesiologists don't tend to have relationships with their patients. They just tend to come in and put people to sleep and wake them up. Um, 
And so here he is on a Saturday of Thanksgiving weekend, minding his own business in his house, and up, walk, up his walk comes this boy who he cradled on the mountain. And you know, they didn't give him any warning, he just they show up and with his parents. And so here they take a picture of Matt with Dr. Harris and his wife. And I just thought it was amazing. They've be, these families have become incredibly bonded and together. Um, so it was very unclear what would happen. Matt was, looked like he clearly was not going to survive, and he, and he was able to take a physics test. And um, so after about eight weeks, it was pretty clear that, that, that he was going to live and that he was going to have uh, brain function, but it was very unclear whether his face would ever heal, whether his nerves would ever come back, what would ever happen to him. This was New Year's Eve at Longwood Gardens with his parents. Um, this is in February with uh, his birthday. And, you know, one of the questions people asked, or people all wondered about during the thing was, you know, Emily was a beautiful girl. Emily wanted to go to med school herself. They're 20 years old. They're juniors in college, you know. Is she going to stay? You know, what is, is she going to stay with him? This, there's no guarantee that he would ever look any different than that. And that he'd ever, and, and you know, Matt will tell you that the one and single reason that he did not crack up and despair. And, you know, when I did this book, when I have to jump ahead a little bit, when I wrote this book and sent it to the agent, the agent right, right, says back to me, he says, well, you know, surely he, surely he was going to, he would be angry and he would be frustrated. There were scenes when the, honestly, in the, the brain surgeon and his crew, his residents would come into the room and Matt would get out of bed and walk up to them and shake their hand and, and he was so optimistic and upbeat. And they're like, look at him. He's a 20-year-old kid. He's, he should be angry. He should be frustrated. He, you know, he should have all these emotions he doesn't seem to have. And they thought it was an indication of brain damage. They thought that he was irrational, that a rational person would be upset. And, you know, Matt's mother and, and family began to really understand that, you know, his whole motivation, he felt so bad about what he had done, the pain he'd put his girlfriend and his parents through, that he knew that the way to make them happy was to heal. And so he was so incredibly motivated to get well and get back on his feet and so grateful for all the care he was getting. And um, he will say that the reason he never cracked was that Emily never wavered. If Emily had shown even the slightest indication that she was going to, this relationship was cooling and she was out, he said, I would have melted and I would have been, you know, my whole world would have come crumbling down. And, you know, the time, I, I was getting involved in this story at this point and, and, and I just figured, you know, time will tell. We'll see, you know, we'll see what happens. And, um, but anyway, you, you can see, so that was the, she showed no, no indication at all of, of anything other than standing with him. Um, so this is like end of March. He had been a college swimmer. He quit the swim team, totally walked away. But when he was in the hospital two years later, now as a junior, the first person who shows up at the hospital really is the swim coach. Now, the Mark Bernardino is the UVA varsity coach. He coaches the men's team and the women's team. Winter is their busy season, their in season. This is a kid who quit his team. And yet, he is there every day in the hospital. He comes every day. He gets Matt out, Matt out of bed. He gets him walking the stairways. He gets him, come on, you can do it. He gets him, like, like he's his coach again. Gets him training. And when Matt gets the clearance from his doctors that the trach hole is healed and Matt can get back in the water, and this is like the end of March, the first thing he does is go to the pool and his coach, his old coach, says, let's see what you can do for 100 freestyle. And I don't know if this means anything to you. It'll mean something to you in the back. He did 100-yard freestyle in 59 point, which is, wow. you know... You know, he's lost a lot of weight, he's pretty skinny, but he was always a really good athlete. And, you know, he's, it's his first time back in the pool. And so this was a picture of that day. And, you know, Martin Bernardino's been a real hero in this whole story. It just shows you just the, the friendships, the relationships, the dynamics, which interest me so much, are so rich in this story. You know, the, the, the bonds that were created, the way people responded to the tragedy and the difficulty, uh, the family, the friends, the doctors girlfriend, the coach, 
a whole community was really kind of a fascinating thing to describe. So Matt, you know, most people in the world are what, seven billion people on the planet. We all get two sets of teeth, baby teeth and uh, regular teeth, permanent teeth. Well, he lost, we have 32 teeth in our mouth. He has, he has three left. He lost 29. And he got implants and a third set of teeth. And here he is admiring them. Um, and uh, here, and so when Matt was sort of the heart of the book and the heart of the narrative is, is Matt was training for a triathlon and wanted to go to medical school when this happened. And he, as soon as he sort of regained his consciousness and his faculties, he's in the hospital and he determines that the measure of his recovery is going to be getting into medical school and doing an Ironman. And so, you know, People, as I said, he was so injured that though when people thought, he, and this was in the fall, that they thought no way he would finish his fall semester and he ought to take the spring semester off and recover and maybe he could come back and resume his studies his senior year. Matt finished his junior, his fall semester on time. He took his spring classes. You know, he went to class looking like he saw his face and, and uh, nothing stopped him. And he... Um, and he still graduated with a 3.9 whatever on time. And he applied to medical school and he got into the University of Pennsylvania Medical School and he went to Penn. And Emily also got into Penn, so they go there together. And as a first year med student, he says, I'm going to do an Ironman. And he signs up for one. And honestly, in November, two years to the day after the accident, almost two years to the day after the accident, he goes to Cancun and he does an Ironman triathlon. And uh, which, if any of you, most of you probably know, you're all athletes or know it, it's a two and a half mile swim in the sea and a um, 112 mile bike ride, thank you, and then a marathon, 26.2 miles. And um, this was also really even further tense, made more tense by right as he's getting ready to do this. The most famous swimmer at the University of Virginia, this legend there, Fran Friend, Crippen, yeah. dies in uh, the Gulf of, of, of Oman um, in the Middle East doing a, uh, he was going to be an Olympian for sure, doing a 10K swim in the really hot water and a few hundred yards from the finish, he drowns. He, they, the theory is he got just overheated and dehydrated in this you know, 98 degree water or whatever, or 90 some degree water in a 110 or 120 degree day. And so the family is like, if Fran Crippen you know, succumbs, you, you know, you, you've had such tragedy, you've overcome your back, you have this beautiful life, you're in med school, do you really want to go swim in this hot water and down in Mexico and, and do this intense, crazy athletic event and put everything at risk again? And so there's a lot of concern in the family and Matt was like, I'm going to do it, I made it my goal and it added to the tension in real time of what he did. Um, here he is, he shaved his head, he's in med school before he goes. Um, one of the concessions Matt made, Matt has no fear of the bike, no recollection of the accident. His girlfriend and his mother do. And they were afraid of him getting back on the bike and riding in, on roads and riding in traffic and, and injuring his face again. And so Matt made a concession. He said, I will never ride on roads that are open to traffic. I'm only going to ride on trails or roads that are closed if it's a race. Otherwise, so he does a lot of training on a trainer. And I'll wear this full face helmet. And he looks like a hockey goalie or something. And, you know, there's a, there was an enormous amount of tweet, tweeting and commenting going on during the race and after the race in Cancun. People all thought this was some sort of secret weapon, special aerodynamic helmet that made him go faster. It's this big, heavy, ugly helmet that, uh, that he promised his family he would always wear. So he did a lot of training in Philadelphia. When I do talks in Philly, I say, if you see a guy in Kelly Drive in that helmet, you know, that's Matt. And so anyway, there he is in the bike portion of his Ironman in uh, Mexico. There he is at the finish. You know, the ending, it's very cinematic. The last mile or two, he's thinking about all the people who helped him along the way and all the things he's been through. It was a very emotional finish for him. He was exhausted. And, and to have him describe what the last few miles were like, thinking about all the people who had helped him. 
Here he is. He did it in 10 hours and 30 minutes. So if any of you do Ironman, you know that's a pretty seriously fast time. I think the splits were uh, 52 minutes or something in the water. He was incredibly fast. Um, and then he did five hours and 37 minutes on the bike. And then I think he did the marathon in 340. Um, and uh, there he is finishing. There he is calling Emily. She actually didn't go. She had studying and went to see her own family on Thanksgiving. This was over Thanksgiving, so he's calling her. There he is with his parents. They went. They're big UVA fans, so they're in bright orange, which is no surprise. Um, there he is at his brother's wedding. This is not quite... Um, this is right about two years after his accident. Now you look at him, and you know, here he is, and you guys remember the 3D CAT scan um, of what he looked like. Now you, would, you, you can look closely. His face is not what he was before, but you wouldn't necessarily look twice if you saw him walking down the street. It's amazing what, what they can do. They, you know, he's totally re reconstructed his face. And I looked at a lot of the... I went and visited and interviewed those doctors at length, and they showed me a lot of pictures of a lot of people. And you know, Matt was very lucky. You know, so many people who have their faces crushed and destroyed don't come out looking as well and as, as successful as he was. He's so fortunate. Um, there he is with Emily on the boardwalk at the Jersey Shore, Mac and Menko Pizza. That was also just um, two summers after it. So um, he's become best friends. The families are bonded with, that's Dr. Park and his wife, the anesthesiologist, who was in Philly recently, last year visiting Matt. Um, and so Matt, you can, this was, so Matt went to Penn Med School. He decided to be uh, a surgeon, a surgical resident. Um, he was toying whether, you know, whether to do, uh, be a brain surgeon or whether to be a facial trauma surgeon, because these are the, that's where his interest was. These are the two people that were the most influential in his life. And so the, the irony, of course, is the end of the story, which is really a fa fabulous thing, is that Matt and Emily graduate from med school at Penn. They get married um, in Philadelphia. Um, they both go back to do their residencies at UVA, and he is training with the two facial trauma surgeons who rebuilt his face. He's a surgical trauma resident training um, with the people who saved his life and... and we constructed his face, and it's really an amazing story. Um, and so that's sort of the book I went off and wrote. And you know, it's it's been really a wonderful event. It's now I just found out it was being published in China. So if any of you read Mandarin, you can get it there. Um, and I guess I'll open the the uh, yeah I'm not up. I'll, I'll open it up for talks. That's me. If anyone actually wants to find me, um, and anyone has any questions about storytelling about the Rocky book, about Matt, about anything, I'm happy to answer them. Yes? The Rocky book's a great one. I bought it a while back. But another Thank question you. here. It here. sounds like you got uh, very lucky in, in that, I mean, probably had a concussion, but that he didn't have any real long-term effects from a brain injury. No, well, face he, was messed up, he right? did have real bruising and real um, uh, shearing and all kinds of horrible things that happened to him. And the... the no, the neurosurgeons were, were shocked at his recovery. They thought that he would be, they were, they were lucky, they thought he would be lucky if he could sit up again and speak again. They were basically fell over. They looked at the, they can't explain it. They're like totally mystified. They'd say 99 out of 100 people who would have his injuries would take years to recover, would need to go to long rehabs, would need to learn to tie their shoelaces again and speak again, and they'd have long-term permanent neural damage. And he, you know, Obviously, there's a lot of bruised and destroyed brain cells in there, but obviously he had enough or was able to rewire well enough that, that, that you know, his surgeon really can't give me a good explanation of why looking at the CAT scans and looking at the injury to his brain that he isn't worse than he is. How long just, was he in, a, was he in, a, he, in an induced coma? He was in an induced for coma a week. A week. Do you remember how long he was in? About a week. He was in the coma for about six help. days. I mean, yeah, I'm sure it helped. They, for, right, they kept him still and did everything, you know, nothing for, for wow. a week. Anyone else more questions? So, is he still doing Ironman? He is still doing, still, you know, if any of you know, residency is pretty brutal, so he doesn't get as much training. He's still running, 
and doing smaller Ironmans. He hasn't gone back to do another one, but he wants to. He will. Yeah, did you have one? Is it difficult working with someone like, like with the whole family throughout that process? Like, how was that on you mentally to follow them and, and, and reach that dynamic of like being a writer but also trying to, you know, I guess, you know, be supportive? Well, you really know, it's important. a very good question. The hardest part of these stories is getting the families to trust you. And all my whole life, I've been really, really fortunate that I immerse myself in people's lives at really tender, tense moments. And astonishingly, they often trust me. And I think this family agreed to trust me because the guy that I play poker with recommended me. And, they, so they, and then, well, you know, the way it works is that once, if you're good at what you do, once you get in, they see how you work, they see how you care, that the trust grows. Um, and so... You know, even Willie Mays struck out a lot and only batted 300. So I know a lot of stories I want to do that families don't let me in. But, and so as far as the relationship goes, you know, I am um, I'm a journalist. And my mission is, you know, is I have to be, I have to tell the truth. And I have to, and I don't, you know, and I'm not out to be their friend. You know, I'm out to tell their story. And so... I am cordial and I am, but I always keep well aware that of the bonds that I'm not, you know, I'm not their friend. And if things go bad, I got to describe how they go bad. And if they're ten, and, and a lot of the best parts of the book are where are the tense moments where there's friction and disagreement and hardship, and you realize that you know things are raw and you have to handle it sensitively and uh, but honestly. And I think if you are honest and you are fair, you give everybody a chance to express their side and handle it delicately, you can navigate these tough moments for people. Um, so it's a lot about how you sort of say. So I am, um, you know, I, I like to think of it as that uh, my loyal. I'm giving them not my friendship. You know, a lot of these stories, like I've kept in touch with the Millers because I did a whole book about them, but I, a lot of, I've done so many stories over the years. You pour your heart into it, you, 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 you share this amazing moment with these people and you're connected, but... I can't stay friends with them. I'm on to the next story. And I justify it by saying I gave them my very best. You know, I gave them uh, the best version of their story I could. And um, so that's, that's, I guess I hope I answered your question. Yes, sir. Uh, I don't want to be cynical, but you took on the story when it could have been a tragic ending. It could have been, yes. Why would they want somebody to chronicle that? Well, they, they, you know, there's, it's a very good, it happens all the time. The, when I got involved in Matt's story, it looked like the worst was over. When I got involved, you know, he, he, he was going to survive and his, he was going to be okay. So the, a lot of the scenes in the book I recreate, but his facial nerves were still a mess and they didn't know how that was going to go. I guess they were so, they, at this point in the story, the family thought it was an amazing thing. They were amazed by the... The miracles they felt had happened, they were amazed by the support and the medical care, and they felt like it was a story that ought to be told. And they, you know, and um, so a lot of the worst was over, I think. But in a lot of stories I write, they don't know. You know, there's one story I wrote about a young man from Upper Marion High School who jumped out of ninth, who was suffering from depression. He was a senior in high school. He was on the homecoming court. He was beloved. And he went out a, ninth, out a ninth floor window. And I'd heard about this, and I wonder, why is this superstar kid jumping out a window, a ninth floor? And he lived. He survived. He fell nine floors and lived. And as a storyteller, I'm thinking, I don't know what the story is. Why did he do it? How did he survive? There's a great story here. And I go to the family, and I say, let me in. He's still in a coma. And they let me in. They let me in, and no one knows how that's going to turn out. It turned out that the story... Uh, really gave meaning and it was an amazing journey. The story really gave meaning to his tragedy and ended up being an a incredible story. He, he even went to the United Nations to, to speak. It's just an incredible journey. But So I don't know why people do. Honestly, why do people trust me? A lot of times I'm grateful they do and I tend to not write about famous people. I like writing about uh, just ordinary people, regular people because I think getting access is easier, but I do feel the trust is the important part, and I do lose a lot of sleep sometimes wondering how am I going to not, how am I going to handle this just right, you know, where I'm not ridicule, I'm not exposing, I'm protecting their dignity, but also telling the, the true story. It's a fine line to walk sometimes. Um, anyone else about Matt or the book? Does he have any side effects? 
He does have some side effects. It's very good. Some of it, he can't, he can't, one side of his forehead won't wrinkle, and he can't really uh, blink properly on one eye. Uh, he can't wear swinging, swimming goggles, traditional goggles anymore, because it won't hold water. He has this weird thing where when he eats, he sweats, because some nerve didn't rewire properly. But these are all pretty minor. You know, he's, he's working a gazillion hours as a surgical resident. He went to med school. He's married and, and living a full, happy life. Um, but, and, you know, he's got a, a carotid artery that's repaired with a netting, and, you know, he's got, he, and he's got dental issues that keep cropping up because he's, it's all reconstructed. But as things go, he's living a very normal life. He's an incredibly lucky young man. Is he heading to be a brain surgeon or a patient? He's decided he wanted to do facial reconstruction. He thought, you know, he, the way he looked at it was brain surgeons end up removing things and cutting things out, and facial surgeons build things. And it was, to him, much more challenging and much more interesting to do construction than, than removal. It was his sort of simple way of explaining it, you know. And he just found it more satisfying and challenging and rewarding to do the... It's really delicate work, reconstruction, so... And I, he has a really valuable and amazing perspective where he has been on the other side of every, every patient he meets. You know, he, he was in their shoes. So that gives him a whole level of empathy that, and understanding that other people wouldn't have had. Um, anyway, thank you guys for coming. I have books thank here. You. Did you have a question? No? I have books if anyone wants them for sale. And it's a beautiful day. Thank you for coming.